So, uh, have you guys, I wonder how many of you have heard of the, the Yanny Laurel thing, yeah. right? So, uh, if you haven't, I'm going I'm to bring you up to speed right now, and we're going to do a little uh, Medway Church Yanny Laurel uh, pull, all right? So, in a second, we're going to play this video, all right? And you're either going to hear in this thing, this is very weird. I thought it was like a trick, but it's not. You're either going to hear Yanny, or you're going to hear Laurel, and then when we're done, we're going to vote. All right, and we're going to see what the flavor of second service is. I've been a little shocked by this, all right? So uh, let's go ahead and play this. Laurel, 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 Laurel. Okay, th th this, this literally blows my mind, all right? How many of you, how many of you heard Laurel? Raise your hand if you're... This just blows my mind. All right. How many of you are Yanny? So it's been about, I think so, some people, it's been about 80-20 overall. Um, I knew this was a jacked up church, but I didn't know it was that jacked up. <laughs> that is so clear to me, Yanny. And I, I, it's just interesting. So, Huh? Oh, I'm glad it's actually, okay. Well, um, so some of you are like, hey, 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 buddy, how in the world are you going to tie this in to Christianity? Just watch, all right? Um, whether you heard Yanny or Laurel, I believe you're going to hear from God today. How was that? Did you catch that? Did you catch that? That's how you do that. Yeah. So uh, thrilled you're here. Uh, let's go to the Lord and pray. Would you bow your heads pray with me? Uh, Father God, Truly, uh, we want to hear from you today, uh, God, and first and foremost, uh, in a spirit of prayer, um, we lift up those folks in Texas right now, God, and pray for your, your peace and your light to shine and your healing to begin, and uh, God, people would be drawn to you, and if there's anything we can do to make a difference in this, this situation, you know, sweep in our country, lay that on our hearts, we are called to be salt and light and difference makers and 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 help us to do that god pray now as we turn to you for you in your word to become alive and speak to all of us may everybody here feel welcome and at peace and at home and most importantly god wants you to grow and change and be a better person and we want that and i promise if you keep coming and seek him he's gonna blow you away and god we praise you for that ahead of time so we love you we praise you and we turn to you now we pray these things in jesus name let's all agree and say amen I want to remind you, if you have kids and they get loud, we ask if you'd step out. We want distraction-free worship. Try to remain uh, seated so everyone can hear from God. Beginning a new series today, very excited about, called The Main Thing. The Main Thing. Jesus came to do so many things and offer us so many things. And I could go on and on about that, but there's heaven, and there's uh, peace, and there's power, and there's eternal salvation and the forgiveness of sins and grace. But he also said in John 10, 10, my favorite, I came that you may have life and life more abundantly, a better life than you ever dreamed of. And if we're going to have a better life than we ever dreamed of, we must learn to keep the main thing, the main thing. And I hope by the end of the message, you understand very clearly uh, what this is all about. But let me just jump right into our first point. Here it is. Distractions will always keep you from God's best distractions in your life will always keep you from God's best. I see this all the time. I see this in marriage. People begin a marriage, and they're doing great, and they try to build that on, on, on the love of God, and something happens later on. They end up divorced or in a lot of trouble, and come talk to me. What happened? They got distracted. I see this in recovery. People are doing well. They have a program. They're working it, and something happens. What happened? Got distracted. I see this in finances. What happened? got distraction. Distractions always keep you from God's best, all right? And, and um, I'll bet you could think of a time in your life where you got distracted, and it affected you, and it kept you from God's best. And I think about this in terms of the local church. The local church is the bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And when a church stops growing or there is a moral failure in a church, there are these divisions within a church, and people start fighting inside the church, I guarantee you what happened is some people got distracted and forgot to keep 
the main thing, the main thing. Great story in the Bible about this. One of, one of my favorite stories in Luke chapter 10 says as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, that God keeps taking me deeper and deeper in this story. I love, I love the Holy Spirit always does that with, with the Bible. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So this lady named Jesus is on the road. Martha says, come, come to my place. You can, you can stay with us. Uh, so Martha had a sister called Mary. And when Jesus got there, as she sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. What was she distracted by? All the preparations that had to be made. This is a nice way of saying Martha was a spaz. All right? Do you, do you have any spazzes in your house? Or maybe better, do you have anybody in your house that's not a closet spazzer? All right? Because truth be told, all my house is a bunch of closet spazzers. All right? And so there are times when people spaz. So Martha is like, uh, uh, what are you doing, Mary? Jesus is here. What are you doing? Do you not know that the toilet needs cleaned? And there's dog pee by the treadmill in the living room? And the, and the, and the dandelions need picked? And the table needs cleaned off? What is your problem? Why aren't you helping me? Jesus is here. And, and, then, and then she says, hey, hey, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work? Don't, don't you care? And then I love this. She goes, why don't you just tell her, Jesus? Tell her to help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha. But I love to add a third Martha, which is Martha, Martha, Martha. And I want to give you a chance because I love doing that in church. So if you want to join in on three, on three, you can do this. One, two, three. Martha, 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 the Lord answered. And, and if you want to have a good Sunday, don't go home and say that to your wife, all right? Don't do that. Um, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary's chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The whole moral of the story is don't get distracted. Keep the main thing, the main thing in life. And there is this God who loves you and came to forgive you of all your sins, and he wants to make a huge difference in your life every single day and walk with you, and he will, but don't get distracted and miss that. Don't miss it. And if I were to be honest, and probably if you were to be honest, um, we're easily distracted. And I would like you to take a second think. In the last week, what have you been distracted by? What has your family been distracted by? If you're like, I don't know, would your spouse know? Would your kids know what, what you've been distracted by? Uh, many things come to mind for me. One is uh, my wife many years ago convinced me I would be father and husband of the year if we bought an above-ground pool, and I drank the Kool-Aid right there in Watson's. I drank the Kool-Aid, and at the same conversation, oh, honey, you won't have to worry about anything because I'm going to take care of the pool, and you'll never have to do anything. That is not the way it's went down, and, and if it's a mess, it messes me up because I want it to be perfect, and it's never perfect, and I can get distracted by this pool, right, easily. And then um, you, some of you know how I feel about the wonderful company of Spectrum. And they put two DVRs in my house. And so I took one DVR and got it replaced because they're always messed up. And, and, and there's still pixelation all the time. And it distracts me. Then it ticks me off. So I think, well, you could just call a Dish Network. But then uh, maybe that I'd still have pixelation and it just distracts me. But it's not important at all. It's not important at all. This last week, I come in here to prepare and preach. and Man, I get, I get up here to preach the Word of God, which is life-giving, life-saving, life-changing. This is big, powerful stuff. But on the way in, I walk by the youth room, and I always peek in there to make sure that the kids are behaving and everything's in order. And in the youth room is these offices with this cool roof. And on, on the roof, on the roof is like a big hula hoop. What is a hula hoop doing on the offices of our youth room? What kind of heathens are back there? What kind of youth pastors we got in this place? How am I supposed to get up here and preach with a hula hoop on the roof back there? I can just get easily distracted. I said this last night, and this dude stays after church and figures out a way to duct tape these pull and get that hula hoop off the roof. That's the kind of people we have at Medway. It was awesome. 
I get distracted uh, easily, and I think you do, and it always keeps us from God's best. Um, i share with you something that um, you may not know. It, it's, it's, it's really hard at times to get up here four times a week and, and try to deliver the most powerful God-anointed sermon you can. And, you know, how do you get up? Because you don't know what, I, what the week has been like, personal things, tragedies, and then even the morning or what have you or some conversation. But you got to get up there and give it your best. So I found this, this trick, and I teach this to other pastors that I try to uh, speak life into. It's been very helpful to me, and then I realized something about it. Here's three things I do if I'm, if I'm having problems, and I always pray through these three things right before I get up here. Number one, Mike, get up there right now. And you preach as if it's the last sermon you will ever preach in your life right now. Just bring it. If this was it, bring it. And, and that means so Sunday, if it, now, maybe there won't be another service. So right now, just bring it like it's the last one, man. And that, that helps me. Number two, you may not understand, but it's, it's been so important to me. Um, have fun. And I tell other communicators this. It's okay to have fun. If I take myself too seriously up here, it sets not a good tone. I've actually done that, and it kind of comes off as angry and stuff, and it's actually much better received. If I can have a little bit of fun, the Holy Spirit still shows up. And again, I don't know if you understand this, but it's, it's actually very important in the reception. And then, and then um, uh, number three, I always need to remember, and every, I tell every communicator, anytime you teach something or do something, there's one person this is life or death for. This is life changing for. Maybe their marriage is on the line. Maybe their sobriety is on the line. Just remember, this is unbelievably powerful to at least one person. And you remember that and you speak to just that, that one person. And what I realized this week was, hey, it's really the same for all of us in life. That each day we get up, we should live our lives as this may be the last day I have because it's true. And we should approach that day and never waste a day. This may be the last day that I have. And never take like work so serious or this so serious that we miss loving on our spouses and our kids and what's truly most important in life. What's the main thing? Never take things so serious um, um, that you miss that. And remember every single day, you have the greatest news in the world. You have the most powerful gift in the world. And every day you're going to have an opportunity to speak into and love people and change lives. And you should look for those opportunities and seize those opportunities. So distractions will always keep you from God's best. So um, we need to learn to keep the main thing the main thing. How do we do that? Point two. If we're going to experience God's best, we must be intentional and laser focused on the main thing. In Hebrews chapter 12 is a great passage of scripture. And I see in here three keys to doing this, to keeping the main thing the main thing. Number one, throw off everything that's hindering you. Throw off everything that's hindering you. Number two, run with perseverance. Run with perseverance. And number three, fix our eyes on Jesus. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to come and grow, and we want everyone here to grow, then you're going to learn something. Some things have got to go. And the beautiful, God wants to take some things away from you. The beautiful thing is, here's how, here's how awesome God is. He wants to take stuff away from you, and because God's working, you actually want to give it away. And that's just awesome, because you're like, oh, God, don't touch that. I'm enjoying that little sin, and the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life, and you want to give it away, and you want it to grow past it, so it's awesome. So for me, uh, some of the things in, in my journey, um, I came, and I had a lot of hatred, uh, all kinds of hatred, and Mike, hatred's got to go. If you're going to follow me, I'm going to take this hatred from you. And that's beautiful. Prejudice. Many of you know that when I was a new Christian, I was prejudiced. I grew up in a prejudiced family. God's like, oh, no, 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 no. I am going to take that and teach you to love all people. That has got to go. Selfishness has got to go. Pornography has got to go. Unhealthy relationships has got to go. For some of you, social media is ahead of things it shouldn't be. It's got to go. Some of you, weed's got to go. Drinking's got to go. Compulsive spending has got to go. Amazon Prime may have to go for some of you. I don't know. All right? All right? But some, something's got to go. It's keeping you from God's best. And uh, by the way, is there anybody else? There was a time when Amazon Prime was a great thing. It can be abused pretty easily with the old one click, right? So, um, yeah, some things have got to go. So what's got to go from your life that you know? And I hope you'll drop it today. Don't be on the one-year plan. Just just drop it because God wants to work in your life. 
Um, second thing we learn is, what do you need to do to stay on the path? Great passage of Scripture. Deuteronomy uh, says, You must be careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God, following His t- instructions in every detail. Stay on the path that the Lord God has commanded you to follow. If you stay on the path, you're going to live long and prosperous in the land you're about to... God wants to make your life better, long and prosperous. But if you get off the path, there's no guarantees. So we got to be laser focused on staying on the path. And when I went to AA in uh, 1990, they said go to 90 meetings in 90 days. In my first year, I went to 547 meetings, which is crazy. Why? I wanted to fight to stay on the path. I knew it was life or death for me, and I had to stay on the path. And I, I want to share this with you because I think it's huge. When you fight to stay on the path, God gives you supernatural power to stay on the path. In other words, I don't know how in the world, I'm like, how in the world did you go to 540? God gave me supernatural power because I'm fighting, and he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to carry I'm going to carry you and help you to stay on the path. Um, five and a half years ago, I was 347 pounds, and I went to, we had, one of the things I try to do as a leader every now and then is ask the leaders that I respect, what do I need to work on to be a better leader this year? So I went to Krista, and I said, hey, uh, this is six years ago, what do I need to work on to be a better leader this year? And Krista said, honestly, Mike, and she took a long time and thought about it, which drives me crazy because I just talk and don't think about it. I don't know if you know anybody. Like, I'm joking, all right? But she takes a long time, thinks about things, and then she goes, I think your health, Mike. I think that um, the number one thing for you would be your health. And I said, what else you got? <laughs> what's, what's behind door number two? You got anything else? I don't want to do that. And, um, you know, God began to lay on my heart, and it's a, it's a battle, but for for over five years now, never missing a day, I've either walked a minimum of four miles or done an hour of cardio every day for five years. And I would say that's impossible because you're going to get sick or hurt because God gives you supernatural power when you fight to stay on the path. Same with church. I went to church and I'm like, oh, I need this to stay married. I mean, I need this to be a better person. So in 20 years, I've only missed church twice. Once when I was in the hospital, and once when my son was in the hospital. Well, how do you go and only miss in 20 years twice? God gives you supernatural power, but you're saying, God, I am laser focused on this because it's the main thing. So uh, I hope you will be laser focused on the main thing. Important verse in Hebrews, it says, Hey, let us hold, let us, let us hold on with all we have to the hope we profess. Let us consider how we may spur one another on Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Nope, but let us encourage one another. So important. And I say, let's be a church like that. Let's not be a bunch of of, uh, baby sissy Christians. Let's not play church. Let's be a group of radical Christ followers that he is first, that we come every week and pray for each other and support each other and encourage each other. And we are an army for Jesus. Let's be a strong church like that. And we're only as strong as each of our people are, but let's, let's be that. That's, that's what it says. So now I want to come to two of the most important questions I can, I can ask. And from this point on, this gets from my heart, man, this is very important for me to you. Um, the first question is this, if, if this is the main thing, the series, what is the main thing for every follower of Christ? If you could sit down at Starbucks and drink coffee with Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, what is the main thing for my life? I believe after today you will know it very clearly what that is. And then the second question is, what is the main thing for our church? Above all, what is the main thing? And again, I believe here in just a few minutes, very, very clear on, on what that is. First, the church. What is the main thing, or for, for you, what is the main thing for every follower of Jesus? Here it is. It's to focus on bearing as much fruit as possible, spiritual fruit, every day of your life. I want to show you three different passages of Scripture that I never lumped together, and I'm like, well, this is powerful. And there's many more throughout the Bible, but I love lumping these together. So let me show you this. Um, First in Matthew chapter 7, watch out for false prophets. And it describes this. And then it says, by their fruit, 
you will recognize them. So God is saying, by their fruit, you will recognize hypocrites and false prophets, and by their fruit, you will recognize the real deal. By their fruit, that's how you'll recognize them. John chapter 15. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Our whole purpose in life is to live for God's glory. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Okay, what does that look like? Showing yourselves to be my disciples. How are you a disciple? By your fruit. You don't say I'm a disciple. You show it by the fruit in your life. John 15. You didn't choose me. This is so powerful. It's like, no, 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 bro. No, no. You didn't choose me. I chose you. God chose you and appointed you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. And when you begin to live your life that way, then God's going to give you whatever you ask. And he says, here's what this fruit looks like. Love each other. Okay, God, that's pretty, pretty vague. What, how does that look like, love each other? So he gives this best story in the Bible, man. Awesome, I don't know if it's the best because there's too many awesome, but awesome story in the Bible. Here's what love looks like. Uh, a guy was trying to trip Jesus up, and he said, uh, what, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he said, love the Lord your God. The first part is simple. We are all called to love God with all we have, all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But he said, there's a whole other part, and it's this. Not only do I want you to love me, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And this expert's trying to trip me. He says, who's my neighbor? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I got a great story about who your neighbor is. And here's the story. He says, there's a guy, and he's going uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho. There's the main road. Everybody has been familiar with the road. And, and he falls into the hands of robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes and beat him and left him half dead, laying there. Naked, side of the road, half dead. He said, and a priest, and in this day, the priest would have been a holier than we think of now. I mean, nothing holier than a sacred priest. He said, a priest happened to be going down, and he saw this guy, and he passed by on the other side, and everybody would have been gasped. A priest? What kind of priest is that? Then he said, there's a Levite, which is an assistant to a priest, very godly person. Same thing, coming up and walks right by. Whoa. Then he said, but a Samaritan, and they're like, wait a minute, you were just talking about priests, now you're talking about Samaritans, because the Samaritan was mixed race and looked down on by the Jews at this time. And so God's saying, I don't care where you come from, I don't care where you've been, it's never been about that to me. So the Samaritan's traveling and comes on where this man is, and here's what he did. And this, when you go to the details of this, it, it really affects me. Because think about your life, and do you show love anything like this? It says, he, he took pity on him. Well, what, do you, what do you mean? What did he do? He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. Picked him up, put him on his donkey, took him to an inn. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper and paid for all this. Then he didn't stop. He said, look after him, and when I return, I'm going to reimburse you for all the expenses you may have. That's, that's crazy. He said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? And the expert said, well, it's the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, that's right. Now you go and do likewise. Well, wait a minute, Jesus. You mean like that? I mean, totally crazy stuff like that. Crazy love. Where you go that far? You mean take it that far? Yes, every single day. That's what it means to follow Jesus every day. Love like that. That's the call of a follower of Christ. Three responsibilities for every follower of Christ. And I want you to think about these, especially all of them. Number one, share God's love every day. Listen to the Spirit of God. Look for opportunities. Don't wait for them to come and, and hit you. Look for opportunities to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus every day of your life. Number two, have you ever done this? Think about the most strategic way you can use your life to share God's love with as many people as possible. Have you ever spent time and thought, how can I, what is the most strategic way for me to use my unique gifts and experiences and gift mix to reach as many people as I can, what, what is the most strategic way? We should all be working through that.
And number three, how can I equip and empower others to use their gift mix to reach as many people as possible? So the main thing for every follower of Jesus is on, focus on bearing as much fruit as possible. When you do that, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what God's going to do when you put yourself out there. But I promise you, he will do stuff. Some you will see and be blessed by, others you will never see till heaven. But I guarantee you that God will be working. Wild story. Monday I was not feeling well, so I was running very late in my day. Monday's my Sabbath, and um, so I didn't get done working out till very late. My son called, and he said, my oldest son, he said, you want to play disc golf? And I said, I didn't really want to, <laughs> you know. But he's older and he's out of the house, and if he wants to do something, then you got to try to take advantage of him opportunities. So I said, okay, I'll play. So we set up a time. We met over in Inglewood, Dan, to play uh, disc golf. And so we're playing disc golf. We get halfway through the course, and this dude comes up to us, and he goes, hey, guys. He seemed a little frantic. He goes, if you happen out here in the golf course, see a Jeep key fob, please let me know. I got, I got my keys locked in my car. I'm just like, okay, dude, whatever, you know, we'll keep our eyes open. I'm thinking, call your wife, you know what I mean? Have her bring you other keys there. Call your wife, bro. We're trying to golf. <laughs> I didn't say that. We're trying to golf out here. So, so we're golfing, and, and we, we kind of keep an eye out. He told every other people on the golf course, if you happen to see key fob, let me know. So we finished golfing. We sat and talked for a while, 15, 20 minutes, and this guy is still out looking for this key fob. And then I kind of felt bad, and I'm like, you know what, let's go see if we can help this dude. So we go and talk to this guy, and we found out he's not local. That was the mistake I made. He's from Deer Creek, Michigan. His, it's getting dark quickly. His hotel that night is in Cincinnati. And he's trying to be cool, but he's like, I got a pretty important business meeting in the morning. Well, he's trying to be cool, but he's like, the real problem is, my glasses are locked in there, and I cannot see well at all without my glasses. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're in a pickle. I, I wish. And I go, what's your plan? And he goes, I don't, I don't know. He goes, I think I'm going to call AAA, try to get this thing towed to the local Jeep dealer, have them make a fob, try to bust into it, maybe get a rental car. I don't know how I'm going to get to Cincinnati. And I'm like, listen, bro, this is my dad. I'm like, listen, you need to hear this. We got you. I said, no matter what, right now we're going to take care of you. I don't work. I don't got to do anything. I don't got to do anything tonight. I got a car at my house just sitting there. If you want to take that to Cincinnati tonight and just bring it back, you're welcome to have it. If I need to drive you to Cincinnati, we're going to get you to Cincinnati. If I need to drive, we'll get you a rental car. Might be able to find glasses that will work for you. We're going to help you. We're here for you tonight. We're, we're going to help you. You're going, it's going to be okay. He goes, okay. So we decided that he was going to call uh, AAA, and me and my son offered, well, for the heck of it, it we're going to go walk this whole course and look for your keys. Well, we'd already finished one round. That's two miles. So this would be another two miles, and it's getting dark. So, okay, we're going to go. So we start walking. My son, first hole, says, dude, we got to pray for God to zoom them keys, man. <laughs> and um, I'm like, cool. And he, right then, out loud, he starts praying, walking home, Father God, zoom these keys. And I'm thinking... Yeah, whatever, it's going to take more than zooming because that grass is thick. Because we had to look for several frisbees. We lost several frisbees, but I'm like, cool, I love that my son, I love my son listens in church. <laughs> and, and I love that he has the faith to pray for God to zoom these keys. I love that. So, yeah, so then we get to, that's hole one. I'd love to tell you, oh, yeah, the keys showed up. Nope, not hole, nope. And we get to hole two, and I said to my son, I'm like, dude, my eyes are strained already. Do you know what it's like to walk two miles just looking in grass for a black thing? Uh, I mean, my, it was crazy. It's like, this thing is not, this is worse than a needle in a haystack. So we decided to walk the whole thing. I'm here. He's about 15 feet there and just glance. And we're walking, walking. And, um, and then we get the whole nine, still haven't found him. And there's the guy. It's like, do we keep going? He's still on the phone, so might as well keep going. Get the whole 10. Um, we get the whole 11. And my son stops. He goes, there they are. What? That's like, that's like, I'm like, dude, let's get this guy. 
So, so I go, look, here's what we're going to do. Just tell him we got tired. It's getting dark. And we're out. And we'll offer to give him a ride home. And then I go, I'm going to ask him if he's a Christian. As soon as I ask him that, you hit the panic button of his car. <laughs> so I have him. So we walk up there. I go, dude. I'm sorry, you know, we're just tired. We ain't going to find him, man. We're out. And I go, are you a Christian? And I'd love to say my son nailed this. He did not. There's like a five-second delay. I'm like, <laughs> he hits the panic button, and the dude just is, he's on the phone, but he's like, <gasps> and he ran and hugged us. And it was special. And so a few things happened, but I want to show you this. I, I took a little video right then. This key was lost in, where are we at? In, uh, Inglewood Dam. Inglewood Dam. I played disc golf 18 holes. I lost this key. It fell in the grass somewhere, and I was not in the fairway most of the time. And this grass, as you can All see, right, is long. I walked 18 holes. I could not find the key. Mike came up with his son. They said, we're going to go... We're going to walk the course and yeah. see if we can find it. I was on AAA, figuring I was going to have to have it towed. They found my key. <laughs> what happened? What did God do to him? Oh, man, he, he... He zoomed it. He zoomed it. He Amen. zoomed it. He zoomed right in on it. Peace out, brother. <laughs> Got it. Hey, what's your name? Where are you from? My name's Chuck from Battle Creek, Michigan. Hey. So as soon as that was over, oh... Then I go, are you really, are you a Christian? He goes, yeah, I got this picture. He immediately got in his trunk, and there's his ESV study Bible. And I go, I go, bro, right now, we stood right there and prayed a prayer of thanksgiving to God. I go, because if God zooms your keys, you better thank him. Or he ain't going to keep zooming. And, um, and it was awesome. And for those of you that are new around here or whatever, I want you to understand the main thing here. Me and my son loved on a man from Michigan. We're the real deal here at Medway Church. We loved on that man the same as a Buckeye, man. <laughs> that wasn't easy. So uh, it, 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 it was awesome. The main thing, because the point is you never know what you're going to do. Because we didn't plan on finding the keys. I, I honestly didn't. My son had more faith than me. I did not think that that would happen. Uh, but you put yourself out there, and you better believe God's working. And every day's opportunities. What's the main thing for our church? More important to me than anything, probably. Um, we're a family. We're a team. We're team Jesus here. And um, I heard a, a church from a, a prominent, a pastor from prominent church in Columbus, the Deep Pockets, and they had a huge dollar expansion. And someone asked how they're doing in the middle of their construction. He goes, not very good. Well, I had my attention. I'm like, why not? He goes, we lost momentum. I think we forgot to keep the main thing, the main thing. And it freaked me out. I got back here and immediately had told our staff, we got to keep the main thing, the main thing at Medway Church. And I told our leadership board, we've got to keep the main thing, the main thing. And I want to share with you the main thing about our church. What is the main thing for Medway Church? And, and I hope you'll know this the rest of your life. It's not chicken noodle dinners. It's not politics. It's not the best worship in town. It's not the best facility in town. The main thing for our church is and always will be sharing God's love with all people. All people. Um, all people. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter what their sex life is like. It doesn't matter where they've been. It doesn't matter what's happened to them. You drop them off here, God, and we're going to be as faithful as we can that we will love them radically. And, and there's nothing we care more about than that. And it is because of that, I believe, that God's blessed his church. We must keep the main thing the main thing. And, and nothing makes you more alive than sharing God's love with all people. We have a, a secret contest here. How many rows in this church can you fill up before you get to heaven? How many lives can you affect before you get to heaven? That should be the thing we're obsessed with. Nothing should fire us up more, more than that. 
I have a confession to make. Sometimes um, lately I've gotten a little too excited. I've really got into fishing this year. And, 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 and I have this camper and this fishing place. And this year I have gotten into it. And I'm going to show you a picture because I love it. Those are big crappie. You see the tape measure? The Lord provided for me. Do you see that? I'm out working hard to feed my family. And uh, I love fishing. And, and what happens is um, when you get up there, and I've been using a real little jig and a real little bobber, but when you're tearing them up and you see that bobber go under, there's no bigger rush in the world because you don't know what's on the other side. It could be huge, and you're just like, oh, and you just don't know. And it's so exciting. And, and, and we went um, fishing and, 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 and camping, and my wife wasn't into it like I was. Like, what do you want to do? I want to fish. What do you want to do after dinner? Fish. What do you want to do tomorrow morning? I want to fish. They're still biting. And so we, she finally, she's done. She's like, can we go home? I'm like, I guess, honey, but the fish are biting. So we come home, and, and we get home. She's like, what do, you, what do you want to do this evening? I want to go back. I want to go back. <laughs> She goes, really? And I'm like, kind of. And, and I was all dirty and sweaty and smelly like fish. And I got, this is a true story. Um, it makes me wonder about myself. I got, I got in the shower and had a fantasy in the shower about a bobber going under the water at my little place. That same rush, that same feeling I get when that bobber is God up in heaven every time you're sharing his love with other people. It's God like, yes, yes, that's you at your best. And I share this story with you. Um, um, my dad was uh, like, a, like a little kid, always, my dad. And um, when I was like eight years old, he wanted a peach tree. I don't know why he wanted a peach tree. So he put this little cheap peach tree in, and it died. The next year, he planted another peach tree. The joke was, for 20 years, my dad had 20 peach trees and never had a peach. And um, I, uh, in his 60s, one Father's Day, I said, Dad, look out in the backyard. I bought a big peach tree and made a sign and just said, I love you, Dad. And before he died, two years later, he got to eat a peach off that tree. And I think that the joy he felt from that peach is the same joy God feels every time we're out there bearing fruit for him. And we're called to do that. The night the, the guy in the keys, we got home, and much to my surprise, he sent me uh, an email. And I went, so he had to look me up. He was creeping on me. A Michigan creeper is what he was. <laughs> and, but I want to share it because it's, I, I, it's so important. Mike? You and your son are amazing. I want to thank you and Mike Jr. for listening to the Holy Spirit today. He prodded, you listened. This man said, I'm convinced that we have daily opportunities to show Christ's love to a lost world if we only make ourselves available. And that's exactly what you did tonight. Whether my keys were found or not, you've showed the love of Christ to a stranger. Well done. God bless you. You'll be in my prayers. And every day, I believe God places people in our lives that we are called to bear fruit and share God's love with it. And when you do that, God is up in heaven and you are at your very best. And when God sees our church, when we are at our very best, it's when every single one of you are living your lives to share God's love with all people. And God is up in heaven just like, that is my church. That is my church at its best. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we love you. I pray right now for all of us, whatever distractions are in our life, may they stop today. May we just drop them today. You take things from us through the Holy Spirit because we got better things and more important things to do for you, God, for your glory. May we look for opportunities to bear fruit every day, Father God. May we look for them, and may we be a church that is obsessed with sharing your love with all people, all for your glory. We pray these things.
In Jesus' name, amen.